We have discussed free agency from every angle except for one, Dynasty. Today is a Dynasty show, and that's kind of Heath's thing, so we will spend at least six to eight minutes on Dynasty today. Uh, no, we'll spend more than that. Welcome to the show. We've got big running back news. We've got the Bears, the Falcons, the Jets all signing running backs. T.Y. Hilton is back with the Colts. I'm excited to do the show today, guys. It's like 70 degrees outside. Spring is here. I'm in a good mood. Good morning, Dave and Jamie. What in the world? Jamie's not even oh here. Oh, my God. <laughs> like, all of that, you were nailing it. The dynasty joke was good. I I, <laughs> I had some responses. I was say, man, I miss 70 degrees because it's like 100 here today. Um, and I, I was going to say, man, if we show. do six to eight minutes, we'll probably pass our off-season record for our most dynasty content because we already did one show. <laughs> um, but now all I can think about is how you called me, Jamie. No, actually, I called you Dave. I called Dave Jamie. So I got them both wrong. I do this all the it's time. It's all good, Frank. It's all good. <laughs> all right. Yeah, actually, I'll be on with Frank and Chris and Scott tonight, 11 p.m. Eastern. You'll hear yeah, it tomorrow. Yeah, I hope they remember your name. Uh, it's, uh, it's, I don't know why they're having me on. Like, I know anything about baseball right now, but listen to Fantasy Baseball tonight. I am sorry. Heath and Dave are here. I can't believe it, Adam. We are going to I talk. I can't believe it. You are a professional host. You at least should know the names of the people that you're on the podcast with. What? show out there changes the talent as frequently as ours you know i can't keep up with it anymore well anyway we have a special I'm guest i'm chalking this up to you being a dad and your kids driving you crazy i have heard because the same. i called you the other day and you had to abruptly end the phone call it was an important phone call because you had peanut butter i think you had peanut butter all over your hands because <laughs> you were dealing with your children and last night i was on the phone with my dad and my son spilled a bag of vegetables and this morning I've heard the same song about 10 times because it was demanded and I, yeah, it was going crazy. So thank you, Dave. I will take that excuse. Special guest coming on the show today. The Fantasy Cops are back for the first time in a long time. All right, let's get to the big news. We'll do the news first and then we will do uh, the Dynasty rankings. So the Are you sure? Yes, I am. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's we'll go. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. All right, the Falcons signed Mike Davis, two years, five and a half million. The Bears signed Damian Williams, one year deal. And the Jets signed Tevin Coleman. Let's start with that. We'll do James White, T.Y. Hilton later. We have Kyle Rudolph news too. Uh, but Heath, yes. what's the biggest news here? Mike Davis, Damian Williams, Tevin Coleman. I don't know that by the time we get to May, any of these will be particularly big news, but this, I would say like my main takeaway is that for me, Edo Smith and Michael P Ryan are no longer um, pop or not popular, attractive double digit round picks as sleeper running backs. And now Mike Davis and Tevin Coleman are a little bit more attractive in that range. And if, if somehow the Falcons and Jets don't add a running back in the draft, then this becomes a little bit more interesting. But I really don't think Mike Davis or Tevin Coleman is going to be a starting running back in 2021. Dave, what's, the, the, what's the most interesting thing for you? I, I think there's a couple of interesting things with each one of these running backs. First of all, Tevin Coleman, that signing makes sense. He knows... Uh, what this offense is supposed to look like in New York. It's the same type of offense. At least we think it'll be the same type of offense that we saw in San Francisco. Uh, Coleman has been familiar with Kyle Shanahan. He's worked with him a bunch of times over his career. Now he's working with the Shanahan disciple. He should be able to get at least a piece of that rushing workload. I agree with Heath. That's a good late round pick. And Michael Pirine really never showed a whole heck of a lot. Over the course of last season, um, I, I fully expect the Jets to add another running back along the way, probably in the draft, probably in the fifth round, and that guy will end up being the best running back in New York. Uh, Chicago, Damian Williams. That one's tough because Williams is a very serviceable, solid running back, a very good backup running back who, when pin, put into a pinch and used as a starter, he's been exceptional. We've seen it before. We saw it in the playoffs a few years back. And injuries have kind of slowed him down. Last year, he didn't play because he opted out due to COVID. I, I seriously believe that he will compete for a role in that offense. It's another mouth to feed, taking work away from David Montgomery. So anybody who thought that David Montgomery was going to get the workload that he had last year, I, you already knew it wasn't going to happen because Tariq Cohen was coming back. Now you've got 
Damian Williams in there too. I'm not 100% sure he'll make the team, but I think if he does, that's a problem. That could be five touches per game that go away from both Cohen and David Montgomery. It makes Montgomery less appealing to me in fantasy drafts. And Mike Davis proved last year he's a good, serviceable backup running back when put into a big role. He can, he can handle it. We saw it. Good versatility. I think the Falcons are going to value that. They Arthur Smith has made the most of all of his running backs that – that he's had really he's only had one that we care about in in Derrick Henry but my guess is that this is a sign of the type of running back that Atlanta wants to get in the draft physical versatile strong and that means Najee Harris and I wonder if they're going to target Najee Harris with their first round pick uh to to solidify that backfield Davis would be the backup guy Harris who's a lot like Derrick Henry could be the lead guy there it would be an amazing fit for fantasy and a great fit for for Atlanta as well and for Harris to get a good role right out of the gate let's see if that happens I, I was I just realized that all three of these backs were basically familiarity um, ads Mike Davis was with Dave Ragone in Chicago a couple years ago Damian mm. Williams right yeah, Damian yeah, Williams. Yeah. That's with the Matt one Nagy I wasn't sure about, but that one in yeah. Kansas City. Mm-hmm. Um, so all Coleman. of them, to me, look like good depth backs that understand what the team wants to do. That will be very instructive to the younger starters. Yeah, Tevin Coleman. He uh, remember a couple of years ago he had 11 carries, 105 yards, three touchdowns, and a receiving touchdown. He had a four touchdown game in the, against Carolina. That was week seven of 2019. He has played 16 games since then, and he has been really bad. 94 carries, 265 yards, one touchdown, 17 catches in those 16 games, That's averaging three yards per carry. 2.82 yards per carry. Yeah. So he has really fallen off. He has been, he has yeah. been in a lot of good backfields, and almost every year he's been worse than someone else. He's always been worse than Devontae Freeman, worse than Raheem Mostert, worse than Jeff Wilson. I don't know that Tevin Coleman's a very good running back, and they gave him up to two and a half million dollars. They didn't pay him. Nobody's getting starters money here. Um, as far as uh, David Montgomery goes, right? Let's say you had David Montgomery in a dy- dynasty alert in a dynasty league. And all three of these running backs have been out there. I feel like Damian Williams is the one you would have wanted the least as competition, right? I mean, I, I would rather him be duking it out with Mike Davis or Tevin Coleman than Damian Williams. I, I wouldn't be thrilled about it. I mean, Dave, you were talking about it. I wouldn't be thrilled about this if I had David Montgomery. No, because it's a, another body in that backfield, assuming that he sticks with the final roster. I don't know if I agree with your assessment that he's the one that I'd be most nervous about. Mike Davis was pretty good last year, but... I believe Davis and yeah, Montgomery but, shared a backfield yes, at one exactly. point. A unique and situation Davis there. <laughs> ended up not being there for a while. So right. I guess Montgomery ousted them. It's it's a good depth move by Chicago. Remember last year there were points where when they took Montgomery off the field, um, they were just miserable at running back. They, they had Lamar Miller on their roster. They needed depth there, and I think that's what Damian Williams is gonna potentially bring. This will end the Cordero Patterson exper- experiment, probably as a running back, maybe, but I don't I really don't think any of these three running backs, like I did downgrade Montgomery a little bit because I think this signals the bears might not give him quite as much work as I was expecting. Of course, but I don't think any of these three running backs are legitimately competing with David Montgomery. Like they're, they're going to get a certain amount of the touches Tariq Cohen's going to get a certain amount of the touches, but David Montgomery is going to get 250 touches. Yeah. But the last time, but if we fast, if we rewound one year ago, and I just said, who's a better running back, Damian Williams or David Montgomery? Guessing we would have said Damian Williams. I think we would have said we don't know. Maybe, but we still may not know. Well, at the time, Clyde edwards helaire was not on the Chiefs. Damian Williams no, was I don't on mean the it, Chiefs. There wasn't really a, a question of like whether or not Damian Williams would play if we're literally going a year ago from right now. Yeah, yeah. So we might have said that. We might have said Damian Williams. Well, but I, when, when you say better running back, I assume you're saying most talent, more talented not, running back. I did not and, mean fantasy. We didn't think very highly oh, of yeah, David I Montgomery. Thought you, I and thought we, you meant fantasy. And we did like Damian Williams, you know? I mean, he couldn't stay healthy. He's had one year in his career but, with more than 50 carries. He's he's probably best suited in a complimentary role. I, but I would have said immediately, we're comparing Damian Williams on the Chiefs to D- David Montgomery behind the wor- maybe, maybe the worst offensive line in football in 2019, or one of. Mm-hmm. Like that was that's not a fair comparison at all. So Montgomery 
The last six games of the year, he was the number two running back in non-PPR, number one in PPR. He had 116 carries in those six games. That's a 309-carry pace. Other Bears running backs combined for 27 carries. So he was obviously a major workhorse. Um, and those 27 carries included one game where Cordero Patterson had 10. You would remove that. and it Basically, it was all Montgomery all the time for the most part. So, yeah, maybe maybe a little bit more of a split. But like I said, yeah. These are these are not starter contracts given out here. And as Heath said, these are depth signings with familiarity. So let's go to T.Y. Hilton. And he signed a one-year deal, $10 million bucks with the Colts. He did not finish as a top 40 wide receiver, though he finished strong. Last six games, he was top 12 in PPR. He was sixth in non-PPR. Um, Heath, what do you think about T.Y. Hilton? It, do you have him in your top 40? Last year, he was 41st uh, overall. Do you have him in your top 40? I when I ran my projections this morning, it actually came out to number forty at wide hey. receiver. So, like once the draft happens, he may not be a top forty wide receiver. It, it wasn't just last year. Um, if you'll remember, he was miserable in ten games in twenty nineteen, and we blamed that on Jacoby Brissett. Um, then he had Philip Rivers last year, and for most of the season was miserable again. His sixteen game pace over the past two seasons: sixty five catches, eight hundred and eight yards, six touchdowns that's a 16 game pace that's absolutely terrible um i don't really have a great degree of confidence as to whether carson Wentz is better or worse for ty hilton than philip rivers i'm not sure it really matters mostly i didn't like this because i was starting to get kind of excited about the opportunity michael Pittman could have as the number one wide receiver now i kind of project it as a 1a 1b situation with neither of them in my top 36 um, it's possible that T.Y. Hilton could still be a good value on draft day if everybody just thinks that he's done. But for the most part, I, I don't plan on drafting him. I put a poll out on Twitter this morning asking what he's worth to somebody in terms of a 2021 rookie pick. And uh majority of the answers said no better than a fourth round rookie pick, which is basically worthless. Okay. And Dave, give me your quick thoughts on James White back with the Patriots for one year, two and a half million dollars. I think that it's going to continue to sting the values of the running backs in New England. We know that they love to mix and match. Damian Harris, we we may never see your best uh, games while you're wearing a Patriots uni because Cam's there. He's going to steal touchdowns. James White's there. He's going to steal catches. It's great for the Patriots and their offense, and their offense should be pretty good, but they are going to diversify like a, like a nerdy stockbroker, and you're going to see them be very frustrating at every position, except maybe quarterback. I'm not sure about that one yet in fantasy. People are going to have a hard time trusting Cam Newton, but if you draft him as a backup and you see what happens after the first month of the season, maybe you'll be happy, but... Everybody else in that offense, it's going to be way good one week, terrible for three weeks. You're not going to want to trust that guy. And then I don't know where they'll have a big game. So it's going to be tough with all the Patriots players. And that'll include, obviously, running backs. It's been that way for a long time. One thing I found interesting when I was going through the team like pass rates and where they threw the ball last year, I think we had the impression that because Cam was there, the Patriots went away from throwing to the running backs. They didn't throw at all. But when they did throw, they actually still led the NFL last year in the percentage of their targets that went to running backs. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Kyle Rudolph has... But not a a lot of that went to Damian Harris, unfortunately. No. Uh, Kyle Rudolph has a foot issue, so the the deal with the Giants might be in a little bit of jeopardy. I don't think so. I think it's going to... It seems that way. It seems that way. I think it's going to stick. Okay. I think it's... Like, they signed it, I think. So, Uh, congratulations. Blue on your old injured tight end. Which, uh, okay, anyway, we have uh, Apple Podcast questions coming up later today, and we're going to have an Apple Podcast review mailbag next Thursday. So if you want to get your questions read on the show, leave us a five-star review, and uh, we will read it We and with a question, and we will read your question. So, you know, hey, this show's great. I love it. Uh, the host is awesome, all that stuff. And then a he question. He remembers the, the co-host names. <laughs> Also, crazy time of year right now for sports. So much fun. NCAA tournament going on. Baseball. 
all the things that got UFC. CBS Sports HQ is your streaming answer, okay? We've got spring training, the NBA trade deadline, UFC 260, NFL free agency fallout, draft coverage, golf picks, the U.S. men's national team. We could go on, but you get it. Sports never sleeps. Neither does CBS Sports HQ. It's available on your computer, your phone via the CBS Sports app, and your connected TV. I watch CBS Sports HQ. Anytime I have some free time, I pop it on the Roku. Um, and it's just a great way to get caught up on the sports world. I learn a lot every day, so please check it out. It's it's really the best, mo- most in the, what have I been here, 11, 12 years or something like that. I'm pretty much blown away by how good, uh, well-produced, professional CBS Sports HQ is. It is tremendous stuff. You got to be watching it. Uh, just got a text message. This shrimp in the Cinnamon Toast Crunch thing appears to be fake. Unbelievable. You're kidding. No, this guy Shocking. is like a scammer. Um, you mean oh. a cereal that's been produced for like 25 years? Wait. Didn't accidentally? Well, I don't think that... I didn't think that it was Cinnamon Toast Crunch. It, it, it was like maybe someone bought it, put that stuff in there, returned it to a store. Oh, that's sick. And they got, but it seems like it was all hoax. Developing story I mean, here. imagine the allergies. We'll keep an eye on it. Was disgusting. All right, more news and notes, real quick. Uh, the Eagles signed Joe Flacco. Marcus Mariota took a pay cut. Tampa Bay gave a couple of contracts out. Left tackle Donovan Smith got a two-year extension. And Dominican Sue, defensive tackle, one-year deal worth up to ten million. Washington is checking in on Nikhil Harry's availability. Seattle signed a couple they of need def- a tight end. <laughs> signed a couple of defensive ends. One of them is a re-signing of Benson Mayoa. And they also signed Kerry Hyder to a three-year, $16.5 million deal. They got to upgrade their pass rush. And Denver signed, re-signed Kareem Jackson, a safety. Oh, yeah. Here we go. The Fantasy Cops are back for the first time in months. This Fantasy Cops question is a dynasty question. It is from Raddenclaw. Or Raidenclaw. I don't know. And he says... He says, I am the co-commissioner of a 12-team keeper league. We are allowed to keep two players each season that cost a round higher than what they were drafted the year before, and we can't keep anyone drafted in rounds one, two, or three. And we can also trade for future picks once, or a future pick once a season. So just before our trade deadline in November, I went to a manager in our league that I knew was a huge Saints fan, and I offered him a very lopsided deal for... Adam may say so. Michael Thomas and a 12th round pick for his Calvin Ridley and a first round pick. Now, keep in mind, Michael Thomas couldn't even be kept because he was a, you know, round one, two, three pick. And Calvin Ridley was a round four pick, so he could be kept. So he would give up Thomas and a 12th round pick for Calvin Ridley and a first round pick. I figured we would go back and forth a bit and settle on the trade straight up without the first round pick. Instead, he countered with giving me Ridley and his first for Michael Thomas and my fifth round pick. Of course, I smashed except because not only is that such a no-brainer in redraft, but Ridley is a keeper. Okay, I'm sorry. This is not a dynasty question. This is just a keeper question. Is this an ethics question? Yeah, it is. I'm I'm waiting for the ethics part. Okay, I won my league, but now many of the guys and my co-commissioner are upset about how lopsided the deal was since Michael Thomas didn't have any fantasy relevance at all and can't be kept. Well, I ran away with the championship and set myself up really well for next season coming off the championship. I said if they all felt really strongly about it, I would consider making the pick a second rounder instead of a first rounder, uh, the pick that he's getting back. They want me to forfeit the draft pick altogether and for me to just be satisfied with having Ridley as a keeper, but I think that's too far. Uh, What do you guys think? He doesn't want to be a jerk and have anyone quit over the league. People are really angry about this. Well, where were they when the trade went down in the first place? Because that's the time. If, if First of all, if you're in a big boy league, everybody is consenting. When you make a trade, everybody should trust that everybody else is doing the best for their team and that it's not a collusion-like situation. I don't think that this is it at all, since there was a counterproposal. And it doesn't seem like someone's cheating to help someone else. So when if that's the situation, when there's a lopsided deal, people need to you know, raise the red flag then and there saying, whoa, wait a minute, this doesn't seem like a good deal. If you complain about it after the fact, and I'm, we're talking four or five months after the fact, then you're out of luck, man. The, the deal is done. It has happened. It's official. It's in stone. The commissioner should get to keep his pick. 
Yeah, I want to clarify a couple things. First off, I, I'd like to know if the guy who accepted the deal knew that he couldn't keep Michael Thomas. Um, so that that would be interesting. But also, this trade took place in November. Michael yeah. Thomas did play like six games after that. So he wasn't irrelevant for fantasy purposes that year. Um, Calvin Ridley was actually, I believe, currently hurt when the trade took place. He did not play the week this trade was made. Um, you can't, like, what are we trying to do? You're fixing a, fan, a trade. Now, you're a detective now. This is really a fantasy detective. F- fixing a trade that happened six months ago that obviously we can see there was some mechanism of um, thinking on both parts. No, I wouldn't do anything. And if people are going to be all bah on the deal and they're going to quit the league, then I, I, I don't think you should placate them and make the trade different. If anything, create a new rule that says, all right, you, everybody's got 24 hours to veto a trade. And if they don't like it, then then uh, there's the, the trade's final. The, the trade end. stands. The fantasy detectives the stands. have spoken. All right, good stuff, guys. Let's go to the dynasty ranking segment now. Okay, so Heath just published new dynasty rankings. We'll pick and choose some things, but you know, I guess the major overall theme here is how free agency impacted dynasty rankings. So uh, I picked some free agency related things and some that weren't to talk about, Heath. But I'll give you the floor and what you want to start with. And, and based on free agency, I don't know the biggest movers and shakers in your dynasty rankings. Well, we talked about this on FFT and five a little bit. I was very encouraged by the fact that Aaron Jones stayed in Green Bay, has some security for the next three years, and doesn't isn't currently sharing with a pass catching running back. Yes, AJ Dillon might steal more touchdowns than Jamal Williams did, might, um, but he's not going to get the targets that Jamal Williams did. So I was very excited about him. There were a couple of quarterbacks who were kind of um, as in, in the words or initials of Al Melchior, DTM, dead to me, for <laughs> dynasty purposes that that have kind of come back a little bit. I'm, I'm more interested in rostering Daniel Jones than I was. I'm more interested in rostering Cam Newton than I was. On the flip side, I think the Kenny Galladay thing was really terrible for everyone in New York besides Daniel Jones. Including Kenny Galladay? I didn't really um no. I don't I don't know that there's a huge impact there because I don't see New York as a place that's going to give 140 targets to a number one wide receiver, but Galladay's never been that guy anyway. Okay. All right. So then let's take a look at a few things here. I, I think it's time to just address Deshaun Watson because we've gotten a I've gotten a couple questions. What do I do with Deshaun Watson right now? So many accusations out there, and it's troubling. And then you've got the trade rumors hovering over him and whatnot. Uh, he went down from five to seven in your rankings. Not a huge drop by any means, but significant to move down two spots. And I mean, would, would anybody even look to acquire? I mean, is he just hands off right now? He's got to be. He's got to be because of what's going on with the lawsuit. He's, he hasn't been traded by now. And there are, the top reporter of the Texans in Houston still expects him to be traded, but his value is getting killed. We don't know what his future is. And that's I, I'm, I'm assuming that's why he's moved down to seventh for Heath, and he could move down even more. And remember, there's also a situation that could play out where th- they go to court with all these cases. Maybe he's innocent, as, as he's professing to be, yet he still stays with Houston. And now you look at the talent around him in Houston, it's not that great. I'm not sure if Deshaun Watson can be a great quarterback for, within another year in Houston compared to what he's been before. So there, there isn't a lot of upside today with Deshaun Watson. Now, these cases get dismissed before the draft. Deshaun Watson's traded. He ends up in Miami. He's reunited with Will Fuller. Of course, his value is going to bounce back. But it's hard to see that happening anytime soon. And the drop from five to seven is, is much bigger than it sounds. Um, I'm getting ready to finish up the trade chart today, and I've got values associated with all the players. And Watson's currently closer to number 10 than he is to number six. So like he was someone who I really considered in the same range as Kyler, Lamar, and Josh Allen, my number two, three, and four quarterbacks. And I kind of viewed them as almost interchangeable. And now he's more like interchangeable with guys like Jalen Hurts, who I do still think like long-term, there's enormous upside for both of those guys. But we have very little reason for certainty about what we're going to get from them in 2021 and you moved justin herbert and dak prescott ahead of deshaun watson 
Uh, he's still one spot ahead of Russell Wilson, then Joe Burrow, then Jalen Hurts. But you can see the trade chart that Heath is referring to to get a better sense of where these guys are. Um, yeah, I'm looking at your rankings now. I don't know if you want to talk any further. I don't think we have to go into Daniel Jones or, or Cam Newton much more. Cam Newton's 20th. Daniel Jones is 15th. Two attack of Iloa, 11th. It's pretty high. Yeah. There, there is a, there's a giant drop from number 10 to number 11 in, in those values. And I, I, like, I really would say now after what's going on recently with Watson, I, I would say there's like Patrick Mahomes is in a tier of his own. And then you've got Kyler Lamar and Josh Allen, and then you've got Dak and Herbert. And then there's a pretty good drop to Watson, Wilson and Burrow for me and hurts for me. And then there's just like I don't have Aaron Rodgers is right there with Tua. I for a win now team, he's obviously much, much higher than Tua. But what is his long term future? How many more years is he playing football? How many more years is he in Green Bay with Devontae Adams? Um, and just a, at last year at this time, it kind of looked like Aaron Rodgers' skills were deteriorating. Obviously, that's not the case, but it could look like that again this year. I I struggle like I agree Tua seems a little bit high at number 11, and he probably won't be number 11 once Trevor Lawrence is officially in the uh, dynasty <laughs> rankings. But I struggle with like who in the teens or 20s I would put ahead of him. Okay. Who in the teens and 20 you would put ahead of Tua? Like n- I, not Baker Mayfield or Daniel Jones, Matthew Stafford and Ryan Tannehill I would rather have this year, but they're – Mid thirties with kind of uncertain futures. Mm-hmm. It's a good yeah, question. But it's almost like those are quarterbacks that could have. You could look at it and say, "All right, three, four more years, they should be fine. They should still be in the league." If Tua has a bad year in twenty twenty one, what happens to him in twenty twenty two? Very, very true. Um, but also, I don't really see a lot of hope that Stafford or Tannehill or Baker Mayfield make a leap and we're heading into next year viewing them as top eight dynasty quarterbacks sure. at their age. That's fair there, to say. There's a, a chance that Tua does. Right. And I guess that's why he's ahead of them because he's got the potential. Yeah, if he stinks in 2021, he could be on the bench in 2022. But if he's good in 2021, he might be good in 2031. Uh, he could just keep it rolling. Tua also just got the best receiver in football, statistically speaking. And JK, just call back to a joke from a few shows ago. And uh, we'll probably get, that's Will Fuller, and we'll probably get a wide receiver in the NFL draft as well. So, um, yeah, maybe maybe 11's too low. Maybe he should be like third, like third, Heath. Think about it. Okay, dynasty running back rankings here. Let's see what stood out in the dynasty running back. Well, Aaron Jones is a big. He's up from 14th to 7th. He already talked about that a little, a little while ago, but a big jump for Aaron Jones. Still behind... DeAndre Swift, which I thought was interesting. Have we seen enough for DeAndre Swift? He's number five for you in your dynasty running back rankings to put him ahead of Aaron Jones. I guess we have that. Like I, I, I understand the argument against that. I think this position is the one where it's the easiest to overvalue youth because for most of them, you're thinking you've basically got until age 28. Well, for Aaron Jones, that means the window's open for three more years, we hope. Um, for DeAndre Swift, that means the window's open for six more years. That's that's a pretty enormous difference. I thought he was maybe the second best back, third best back coming into this year. When they gave him the ball, he looked awesome last year. I love his offensive coordinator situation. I don't worry so much about Jamal Williams. Um, I mean, obviously, there's there's not going to be a 300 touch situation. It doesn't look like for Swift, but I don't know that he needs that because he's awesome. Dave, who would you rather have in Dynasty, DeAndre Swift or Aaron Jones? If I'm trying to win a championship this year, it's Jones. This year, next year, my window is open. I want the running back who's hitting his prime on a on a competitive team. And that's Jones. If I'm not anything short of that, I'd rather have Swift. And I think that Swift is going to be a good back in the league for a while. I I like his pass catching props. I like the upside that his short yardage touchdown production uh, showed us as a rookie. And the Lions aren't going to be terrible forever. Uh, I know they kind of have been terrible forever. But there's a really good opportunity for DeAndre Swift to be a staple in that offense. 
for the next three to five seasons. So if, I, if I'm looking long term, Swift is who I want. If I'm trying to win now, it's Jones. Dave, without having rankings in front of you, where <laughs> in your mind do you think you would have Josh Jacobs in dynasty running back rankings? I, I am glad you brought him up because I was doing research on that Raiders backfield before the show today that uh, if if I have time, I can get to. But I think he'd be behind both of these running backs. I'm nervous. But how that, far behind? Because he is behind both of them. But, you know, are, uh, we, are we talking? At least, I mean, uh, where, so what numbers are Swift and Jones in, in your rankings, Heath? Swift is five, Jones is seven. Okay, so Jacobs might not even be like 10. He might be like 12. He might be 14. He'd be down a little bit. And and the reason why I say that is because the addition of Kenyon Drake continues to make me squeamish about Jacobs. We already know that he's just the Raiders in two seasons never committed to him as a pass catching back. And he was terrible in short yardage situation last year. 31% conversion on goal to go uh, from three yards or closer. Drake was pretty good. He was over 50% on one yard to go from the end zone. But overall, he was like 42%. So it just made the, the signing even more of a head-scratcher. But maybe Drake was signed to bring back some of that passing down work that we saw from him prior to last year, maybe to be a battering ram at the goal line. Those are two areas that Josh Jacobs should be dominating as a former first-round pick who had those types of skills when he was at Alabama. And now I'm nervous about him being a full-time workhorse back. And if you're not a full-time workhorse back, I don't care how young you are, you're not going to be ranked highly in anybody's rankings. So I'm, I'm kind of nervous about Jacobs. And if I can find somebody who's not in my dynasty league, I think I'm trying to trade him. Mm, I well, think I'm trying to call, get maybe a mid first round pick call in the Heath. rookie draft for him. Call Heath. Cause Heath is pretty high on him. <laughs> I, I will. I will. I'm, and I've kind of, I feel like the past couple of years, I've maybe been a little bit lower than everybody else on Josh Jacobs. But I just, it's for the reason that I didn't really think he was the full-time feature back. Now, he's he's been very good for the most part when he's touched the football. Um, but I still see a soon-to-be 23-year-old, who or just turned 23, but it'll be a 20, age 23 season. And he's already shown the ability, without playing even 60% of the snaps, to be a top 12 fantasy running back. He's shown two years in a row that he's a top 15 guy, even without the 50 catch thing that we like to look for. And I don't think Kenyon Drake's going to come in and be like a 50 50 split. I don't know that Jacob sees a lot less work than he has the past two seasons. And so what let are the Raiders seeing? Wait, hold on. Why? Let me let me just say he's got him eighth in the rankings. So it goes McCaffrey dynasty rankings McCaffrey, Barkley, Cook, Jonathan Taylor, Swift, Kamara, Jones. Jacobs, Zeke, Miles Sanders, Derek Henry, J.K. Dobbins, Cam Akers, Joe Mixon, Austin Eckler, James Robinson, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Nick Chubb, by the way, 17th. That's pretty interesting. Um, yeah, like, like, why is Nick Chubb 17th and Josh Jacobs is 8th? Uh, you know, the sim similar situations. Hunt probably going to have a bigger role than Drake. But Chubb is better than Josh Jacobs, I think. I think Chubb is one of the few you know elite running backs in the nfl maybe i'm wrong i don't know um but yeah it's a big gap there all right dave i'm sorry i cut you off though but yeah he's got him eighth that's that really struck me because everybody is killing the raiders they don't understand why they did this they give away their offensive line they they give pretty big money to a backup running back and it sucks for josh jacobs we think but he doesn't seem to be as bothered by it well he oh, sorry go ahead that's my bad well do uh, you want me to answer the? Yeah. You want Dave to continue, no. or me to answer the Nick Chubb thing? I want, I want Dave. You to I want Dave to continue, and then I want you to answer the Nick Chubb thing. Okay. I think I think you you've got the optimistic side and the pessimistic side on Josh Jacobs, and not that Kenyon Drake is going to come in and be a fifty fifty guy, but what if he does work in short yardage situations and take Jacobs? I mean, yeah, Jacobs is already off the field in a lot of passing down situations to begin with. Maybe that continues to happen. Uh, and what happens if Jacobs takes a step back this year, maybe because of the offensive line? And now the coaches say, well, we probably can't count on him for even 15 touches per game. And we've got Drake, and we'll see what Drake can do. Drake gives the Raiders coaching staff options because they may not have liked Devontae Booker enough last year to go in and, and take work away from Jacobs 
consistently when Jacobs wasn't playing well. There was a game here or there where Jacobs wasn't doing great and Devontae Booker might have seen a little bit more playing time than normal. But I'm, I'm nervous about this move. I'm nervous about Jacobs and fantasy. And the offensive line doesn't help at all. Jamie? The offensive line doesn't help. The, the difference for me between <laughs> Jacobs and Chubb, and it's a couple of things. One, all of these rankings are based on full PPR leagues. And while Jacobs doesn't do a lot in the passing game, I do think he's going to catch more passes than Nick Chubb. Two, I think Kareem Hunt is a bigger threat than Kenyon Drake is. Now, Kareem Hunt's not a very big threat to keeping Josh Jacobs or Nick Chubb from being a borderline top 12 running back, but I do think Kareem Hunt's going to be more involved than Kenyon Drake personally. That's the way I'm projecting it. And three, Josh Jacobs is two years younger than Nick Chubb. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, we're going to take a break here. And when we come back, uh, wait, are there other running back topics I wanted to get to here before we take a break? James Robinson. James Robinson, yes. Down from I eighth that was interesting. to seventeenth for James Robinson. After this, we're I'm, gonna take a break. Like after the uh, draft, if it's just him and Carlos Hyde, then that may revert. But I heard he, I was a little bit stubborn. I think early in the year in ignoring people's worries about Jacksonville adding running back depth, and when they're they are actually talking about adding a running back to complement him and not having him on the field all the time. And then you factor in, obviously, his um, like no cost to them to move on. I, I just got a little bit more concerned. So there's a, a wide, a big group of running backs that are close in value in that range. And a small change had a major impact. All right. And I think I'm still higher on than the consensus in terms of dynasty ranking on James Robinson at 17. We're going to take a break now. When we come back, we'll look at wide receiver dynasty rankings, tight end dynasty rankings, answer your questions via Apple Podcasts and emails at fantasyfootball at cbsi.com. Back here to talk about dynasty wide receiver rankings and tight end rankings as well. Adam Azer, Dave Richard, Heath Cummings. I got it right. So in terms of free agency, Juju Smith-Schuster, I noticed, still in your top 12. Uh, talk about that. He's ahead of CeeDee Lamb, DJ Moore, Keenan Allen. D- Juju still in your top 12. What this really comes down to, and um, I've, I've had some Twitter fights about this already, but I don't believe that the eight yards per catch that Juju averaged last year is 8.6 is more indicative of what he'll do in the future than what he'd done the three years prior. And I know that Antonio Brown had a huge impact on his first two seasons. But in 2019, he played with atrocious quarterback play and through injuries and still averaged 13.1 yards per catch and 7.9 yards per target. That collapsed last year in a really... I feel like it was a dumb passing offense where they just threw the ball three yards every time. They didn't want them to get hit. It was the worst. Um, But I just don't think that that's what he's going to continue to be. I'm not factoring in his 2017, 2018 efficiency as much as I have in the past, but I'm still factoring in 2018 a little bit because it's within the last three years. And that's the way that I approach things. He's still just 24 years old. He's still younger and always will be than Deontay Johnson. Um, I, 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 he has demonstrated 1400 yard upside. You give me a 24 year old wide receiver that has that type of production in his recent past coming off of a bad year like that. And I'm still very interested in him. Yeah. At the very least, he's going to be a serviceable starting wide receiver in the national football league for the next five plus years. Just because he didn't get a monster deal in free agency this year doesn't mean that he's not going to have a job. But you've got to you've got to call him what he is at this point, which is volume driven. And even if the volume eventually goes down, I think you're right. He, the yards per catch can go up. Last year, not necessarily indicative of that. But is he getting pigeonholed into being a slot receiver? Is he going to be a possession receiver for the rest of his life? He's not going to be known as a big play guy. He's just going to be a, a nice big target Stop. that can gobble I, up why, catches. But why? 
I'm going to take issue with that every time you say it because before because last you've year, seen him have a couple of 97 two, yard how, plays. He's I know. probably the only player in NFL history with two 90. He's got to be one of the only ones with two 97 yard touchdown catches. He's obviously capable of making big plays. Well, any receiver is capable of making, but he's big more plays. capable. He's he, he, you know, like. If he can get out of the slot, and I do think that's a big deal because he was almost exclusively a slot receiver last year, and and that sucks. Uh, but also, he was on a team that didn't throw the ball downfield, and that also sucks. But he, he you know, he signed a one year deal, so I just think to have him in the top twelve. I mean, I kind of, I guess, I kind of disagree with a couple of things that, or something that both of you are saying. Like to have him in the top twelve, I just don't know where where his future is. He's in a one year deal with a team that's that is really shaky right now, could have a really bad offensive line and maybe a bad quarterback, and he could be third in targets for all we know. But then again, like, where where is he in 2022? And then, Dave, I just don't think he's... I just don't think he's what, what you're saying that he is, which is, like, just dependent on volume and, and basically not a big play threat at all. I, I think he's proven that he's better than what he was last year. He can make big plays when he does something after the catch. Breaks yeah, a tackle, but, gets into open space, but... You can say that about almost any receiver in the National Football League when they break a tackle. Yeah, but he, but he's done it. That's the thing. And, and you know, it's not just breaking tackles. He can outrun people. I mean, I, I went back and I watched those touchdown catches. You know, he's he's, he's he burning guys. He had a 76-yard touchdown in 2019. And that he means was something with, to me. I mean, he, he, from Mason Rudolph, and he was credited with zero broken tackles that year. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Maybe Which that means not nothing. Maybe it's just, <laughs> right. well, you know what? Like, Devontae Adams is credited with, like, two or three broken tackles this year. That's that, true. It's a stat yep. that means almost nothing for wide receivers. Uh, so, I don't know. I just, I do not think that Juju Smith-Schuster... Except Schuster, when a receiver does it a lot, then it yeah, it matters for wide receivers. I don't think that Juju Smith-Schuster is what he was last year. But if they continue to play him exclusively in the slot, it's going to take away his big play capability. How many more years do you think Juju Smith-Schuster, forget about the teams he's on, how many more years do you think he can get north of 50 catches? Oh, many as he plays in the NFL? Yeah, All but, right, what about 70 catches? Seven? Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, that's the whole That's the whole thing, is that we, we all agree that there's going to be high volume for him. Where there's volume, there's fantasy production. I don't necessarily agree that he's a top 12 dynasty receiver, but he shouldn't be shoved in the in the 20s by any stretch. And he should not be a sell. He should. He's a sneaky buy in Dynasty is what he is. Yeah, because I would guess the consensus on Juju is closer to 20 than 12. No, he should be somewhere in between. Okay. 15. 16. 15, 16? Sure, 16 works. Uh, I'm, I'm, on our, <laughs> I'm on our rankings page, or your rankings page with the Dynasty stories, and there's a FFT video playing in the corner, and like Chris's cat is just everywhere <laughs> like all i've been seeing uh okay elsewhere in the wide receiver rankings uh deke this is not free agency related but tell me why you moved dk metcalf and justin jefferson ahead of calvin ridley i saw that on the list and i was uncomfortable with discussing it good <laughs> well it's Step that's not really comfort good zone that's 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 bad um uh, probably um, I don't have, I did not have any intentional, like they are all within a fraction of a percent of value of each other. Okay. So I, I don't have any, um, good answer for you. Sorry. That was awful. That's okay. Curtis Samuel up from 49 to 35. Big jump for Curtis Samuel. I was really, first off, like wide receivers so deep, there's like 130 receivers listed. So a jump that big at any other position would be much more significant than a jump that big at wide receiver. But I was concerned about how Curtis Samuel would be viewed. Um, I know that the industry's always loved him and he's always been a popular breakout candidate, probably could be again. But he's basically had six good games in four years in the NFL, and he still hasn't had a season that you would look at the whole season and say, as a receiver, he had a good year. The fact that he went to Washington where he can be a complimentary piece to Terry McLaurin, and which I think is his best role. He's not going to be a number one. And he has Ryan Fitzpatrick, at least in year one, throwing the ball to him. I'm, I'm encouraged. I think this, um, another familiarity signing but it's a coaching staff that knew him and wanted him and knows how to use him. So uh, I'm more encouraged about Samuel. Dave, if you look at the rankings here, Samuel 35, then let me tell you the five guys right after him. Miko Hardman, 36. LaVisca Chenault at 37. Michael Pittman, 38. Jalen Rager, Michael Gallup. 
So Chenault, uh, Hardman, Chenault, Pittman, Rager, Gallup, right after Curtis Samuel. What do you think? Pittman should be ahead of Samuel. I think Rager should be ahead of Samuel, too, because I just think there's more upside for those two guys to become wide receiver ones for their team versus Curtis Samuel becoming the wide receiver one for Washington or whoever he plays for after Washington. Uh, and maybe, uh, I don't know if I can really say the same thing for LaVisca at this point. They added Marvin Jones. Chark, for now, is still on the roster. They could always add another receiver in the draft. I, I don't know if I feel really good about Visca becoming a number one receiver for Jacksonville. That would be a close one. Uh, maybe I would lean toward age there and put LaVisca ahead of Curtis Samuel, too. But that one's close. Okay, great. And Dave, there are actually, Heath lied a little bit. He said there were 130 people ranked at wide receiver. There are 128, which future Hall hmm. of Famer checks in at 128 in Heath's dynasty wide receiver rankings? Larry Fitzgerald. Correct. Correct. Okay, let's look at tight end, Heath. What's the one thing you want to highlight here with your tight end rankings? Um, I mean, it's probably the fall of Hunter Henry and Evan Ingram both. I don't know how Evan Ingram could have possibly had a worse off, a worse off season. I guess he could get cut and nobody could sign him and he could just not be able to play football anymore. Um, but they brought in Kyle Rudolph. They brought in Kenny Galladay. They still have Daniel Jones. Um, and Saquon's Ingr coming back. And Ingram's not even like we talked about this on FFT and five as well. We, Ingram's not even someone who's young enough that we could say, but look at that upside and his athletic ability and the potential of what he could be. This is, he's going to be 27 years old at the start of this year. He's he still should be at his prime. He's still athletic. And he hasn't shown his prime yet. Um, he's shown it in spurts. <laughs> sure. So, so <laughs> he's shown his what? athleticism. The guy right behind him, Tyler Higby, has shown it in spurts mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Well, no, he, he, Tyler he Higby had showed spurt, it in spurts. Unlike anything Evan Ingram's ever he showed snitched. it in spurt. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the <laughs> drops, the, it just the drops just kill Ingram's stats. You know, uh, so yeah, and that's unfortunately a part of being a good tight end in fantasy right. football is catching the ball. It's not just that. He also, how many downfield routes did he run last year? Certainly for the first half of the year, he, he wasn't running a lot of them. What's his so, injury history? Yeah, oh, yeah, that's another huge thing. And how does Jason Garrett use tight ends? He uses them four yards away from the line of scrimmage because he had Jason Witten for two decades. Now he's got two of them. All right, well, you have Jonu Smith and Hunter Henry back-to-back. -back. Henry 15, Smith 16. So yeah, so so that's I, oh no 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 I no no I'm sorry I'm sorry Smith was 16 now he's 14 Henry's 15 so just Smith moves up two spots Henry drops from nine to 15 and that that's one I believe John Smith actually was a bigger priority to the Patriots than Hunter Henry was Hunter Henry talks about how the, talked about how he was disappointed when they signed Smith because he thought that meant they were out on him and then they went and signed him as well um, Henry. Definitely has the better production. I project them almost identically, but I think it's a coin flip right now which one's going to be better. And I'm leaning towards the guy that the Patriots made a bigger priority. Yeah, back to back. So uh, understandable there. Travis Kelsey up from four to three. I think last time we spoke, he was fourth. Moved this is ahead. another one of those situations where I think it probably had to do like he and Waller are so terribly close. I think it had to do with a small change to Waller's 2021 projection. Um, I think the more interesting thing that seems no one else in the world agrees with is that I have Mark Andrews at number two at tight end and he's the consensus number four. And I, I ran a Twitter poll yesterday asking who should be number one with Kittle Andrews and um, Travis Kelsey and Andrews got 3% of the vote. The other two had like 45. Um, but I, I do want to get the, uh, the Mark Andrews stat out there. He is the fourth tight end in, since 2000 to have 2000 receiving yards and 20 receiving touchdowns in his first three years in the NFL. And he's 25 and he's 25. You knew the, the first three tight ends to accomplish that feat are Gronk. That is correct. Tony Gonzalez. No, since 2000. Oh, right. since 2000. Um, what was the stat? Uh, Jimmy Graham. 2,000 yards, 20 touchdowns in their first three years. Gronk, Jimmy Graham are correct. Greg Olson. 
No. no. Much better. Much better than that. You weren't far off on uh, Tony Gonzalez. He's just a couple years younger. I don't know. Gates was before. No, nope. Gates was Gates, after oh, 2000. Gates, Gates, Gates is yeah. the answer. Yeah. yeah. Jimmy Graham, Antonio Gates, and Rob Gronkowski, and now Mark Andrews. Um, I, I think a- Andrews, he's closer to Kittle at number one for me than he is to Kelsey at number three. And for what it's worth, the fact that the Ravens haven't made a big splash at receiver oh, yep. in free agency. They are going to draft someone. I think they will too. But yeah, I, mean, I, I don't know if that's necessarily like uh, the, the thing that bothers me the most about Ingram is that he's not an every down player. I'd like to see him become an every down player. Andrews. Yeah, yeah, that's what I meant to say. Andrews. Yeah, yeah we know Kelsey. Yeah, his production went way up after Nick Boyle got hurt last year, which really shouldn't be something that we have to say, right? Nick Boyle shouldn't be the reason why Mark Andrews struggles, but that's that was interesting. Yeah. He was he was pretty disappointing. I mean, last year. I think people who drafted Mark Andrews as high as they did last year were disappointed with the results. Not as bad as the people who drafted Zach Ertz, but the people who drafted Andrews were probably unhappy. But it doesn't mean that he's going to be that way every year of his career. Keith, uh, what you said about what he's done in his first few seasons, that's huge. And I don't think he's going away anytime soon. Okay, let me see if I have... Yeah, so I was trying to say he was disappointing before the the injury, but he was still on pace for 10 touchdowns. Okay, so it was eight games with Nick Boyle. And his pace was 52 catches. This was his pace, not what he actually did. 52 catches, 594 yards, 10 touchdowns, and on pace for only 88 targets. Without Nick Boyle, he played six games. Or This includes the game in which Boyle left with an injury. He was on pace for 117 targets, 85 catches, almost 1,100 yards, only five touchdowns. So the touchdowns were better. You know, that's fluky, whatever. But you're talking about... On pace for 52 catches with Boyle, 85 without him. 594 catches with Boyle, or yards with Boyle, 1,077 yards without him. 88 targets with Boyle, 117 without him. And I think that was with Lamar Jackson actually, th- yeah, it was with Lamar Jackson throwing three fewer passes per game uh, but, in without Nick Boyle. So, but he was better with Nick Boyle when Hayden Hurst was there. So if he has Hayden Hurst and Nick Boyle, he's awesome. <laughs> If he doesn't have either one, he's okay. Well, I think it shows that his 2019 season was statistically fluky, which we knew going in because Lamar Jackson's season was statistically fluky with the touchdown rate. You, you know? So the that's touchdown, just a concern. Yes, he's not going to have a 10% touchdown rate, but he might have an 8% touchdown rate. Elite tight ends do that. And like the fluky 2019, he was on pace for 105 targets, 68 catches, 909 yards. It's not... It's not like it was all touchdowns. Okay. Uh, all right. Then it's time to read some questions from our listeners. Apple podcast questions, emails. Uh, first, I got to tell you about the Stitcher app, the all new Stitcher podcast app. It's been rebuilt from the ground up to make it easier to listen to podcasts on the go or on the revamped web player. Stitcher is home to all your favorite podcasts from classics like My Favorite Murder, This American Life, and How Did This Get Made? Um, and all the CBS shows. You got Ion College Basketball, Fantasy Baseball Today, and, you know, Fantasy Football Today and Fantasy Football Today in 5. We're on Stitcher. We've been on Stitcher for a while. Stitcher is actually a, an old partner of ours, and I love the Stitcher app, but it's better than ever now. And in Stitcher, you have more control, like setting your download preferences per show and the ability to listen at virtually any speed. With Stitcher, you can listen to your podcast anytime, anywhere. So give the all-new Stitcher a try. Download it in the App Store or at stitcherapp.com slash download. From Apple Podcasts, this is Nick in a small town in Michigan. Um, Ypsilanti, isn't wow. that how you say it? I don't know, but you're really like off your game if it took you that long. Yeah, I know, I know. 12-team PPR dynasty trade advice. Give Mark Andrews. Get... Marvin Jones and pick 105. Mark Andrews for Marvin Jones in the fifth pick in the draft. He also has Irv Smith, Blake Jarwin, and Harrison Bryant. And he has the seventh pick. So he would have fifth and seventh here. I'm in because of the tight end depth that you've got. You can help out. You can help yourself out at another position with that 105 pick. Yeah, I... 
It's the the 105 and Mark Andrews are very very close. This when I did finish the trade chart this week, um, I'm going to break it out. I've currently got Andrews in between an early 21 20 first and a mid 2021 first, um, but I think the fifth pick is going to be about a push. Marvin Jones doesn't have a lot of lot of dynasty value, but he's a fine tiebreaker. And you could with 105 or 107, maybe 107, you could get Kyle Pitts in there. So sure, place that tight end. From A Winters Nine, how would you rank the following heading into 2021 in a full PPR dynasty league? Cam Akers, Antonio Gibson, DeAndre Swift. I've got it Swift and then Akers and then Gibson with Akers closer to Gibson than he is to Swift. I'll say... I love Cam Akers long term. I like Swift too. PPR, I've been leaning towards Swift this whole time. I'm going to stick with that. So Swift, then very closely behind Akers, and then Gibson pretty closely behind them too. From Lamb GT91, keep two in PPR. Travis Kelsey in the second, Jonathan Taylor in the third, Miles Sanders in the eighth, J.K. Dobbins in the ninth. So it's Keep two, mm. PPR. Kelsey in the second, Taylor in the third, Sanders in the eighth, Dobbins in the ninth. If you can keep them long-term, I'm keeping Taylor in the third and Dobbins in the ninth. If it's only for one year, I'm going to go with Kelsey and Taylor. I will go with Taylor and Sanders. All right. So let's, you're keeping Jonathan Taylor for sure. Let's read some emails here. This is from Dan. Dan is from where, Dave? Saugatuck, Michigan. Good job. Hi, Gus, Josh, Scott, and George. Ugh, no idea. Gus, Josh, Scott, and George. Hmm. Okay, full PPR. Keep two. Um, drafting from the eighth spot this year. It is a three flex league. Interesting. One running back, two wide receivers, three flex, and a tight end. Uh, so keep two. Second round, Travis Kelsey and Lamar Jackson. Both in their final keeper years. Fourth round, A.J. Brown. It's PPR. Fifth round, Terry McLaurin. Twelfth round, Antonio Gibson. Hmm. And we're keeping two of these guys, right? Yeah. Kelsey and Jackson in their final years. They're in the second round. Mm -hmm. A.J. Brown in the fourth. McLaurin in the fifth. Gibson in the twelfth. They can be kept for two years. AJ, I mean, A.J. Brown feels like... And Gibson, First one for me. I oh, mean, Gibson, Gibson in round 12, yeah. Yeah, that's it. for two years? Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Brown and Gibson? I think I'm going to go Brown and Gibson. Jamie? I thought maybe it was Gus Farratt <laughs> and Josh Freeman, and I was trying to see if I could link them together with Scott Mitchell, but uh, un unable to make that connection. So... Now I'm going to actually look at the question <laughs> and a uh, full PPR two keeper. I'm keeping Antonio Gibson and I am keeping Travis. No, AJ Brown. There you go. Uh, okay. This is from Ty Witt in a town 10 miles south of Fairbanks, Alaska. Uh, let's, let's go with South Van Horn. Okay, it's actually North Pole, Alaska. Dear Urban, Fred, <laughs> Oscar, and Stephanie. Urban, Fred, Oscar, are these Myers? I don't know. Those are Myers. Oscar Meyer. Uh, I don't Urban know who... Meyer, Fred Myers, Stephanie Myers. Okay, I, I don't know all of them. 14 team. Josh. Scott. <laughs> yeah, it's. Sorry. 14 team Dynasty League, PPR, one quarterback. I have the first two picks in the rookie draft. Oh, I, cool. I want to draft Chase and Harris, but my only quarterbacks are Wentz and Mayfield. It's 14 teams, one quarterback. Do I consider drafting Trevor Lawrence? Do I trade down somehow and look to get a QB that way? Do I stick with Wentz and Mayfield and draft a stud running back and receiver? Um, what do you think? I'm looking over his roster. He's got DJ Moore, AJ Brown, Terry McLaurin, uh, Lockett, Mims, Chenault, Gallup. He's, He's good pretty there. good at wide receiver. Yeah. I don't know if he necessarily has to go and get one of Chase Waddle or Smith. And his running backs are Jacob, Jacobs, Cream Hunt, Chase Edmonds, Zach Moss, Daryl Henderson. He needs a running back. 
I'm, I, and he could probably use a tight end too, Gasecki and Irv Smith. Eh, maybe not. Maybe he can wait a year on tight end. I'm good with spending uh, the first pick on Harris. Harris is going to be my favorite running back in the draft class. And then if you can trade down from two to about five through seven, you can get Trevor Lawrence there. I think that sets up your team for the best. Yeah. And if you miss Trevor Lawrence, then just take Kyle Pitts. I think one of those two will be there. If Trevor Lawrence isn't there at five, then that means you can get one of those. Uh, you probably right. can't get you know, ETN. Right. But you could get a stud wide receiver if you'd like, or yeah, um, Pitts. Okay. And this is from Roy W. I'm not sure who I should keep this upcoming season. 12 team league with a linear draft. I pick 10th. It's kind of a tight end premium league. Tight ends get one point per reception after five catches. The rest is non PPR. We have to keep three, but can keep a fourth in replace in uh, in place of our first round pick. So since I picked tenth, I'm keeping four players from the list below. Mm-hmm. So he's keeping Mahomes. Pick three more: Kareem Hunt, Jeff Wilson, Devonte Adams, Travis Kelsey, Cam Akers, Chase Edmonds, James Robinson. Yeah, okay, I'm just going to limit it. Adams, Kelsey, Akers, James Robinson. I think you got to pick three of them. Not T.Y. Hilton. That's on the list. <laughs> Gabriel sure? Davis. I forgot. <laughs> uh, this ain't easy because he, he's got to pick from Adams, Kelsey, Akers, and Robinson. Three of them. And Kelsey has to be one of them. Kelsey the, has the to be one of them because of the tight end premium. And it, I know it doesn't seem like it's that much of a tight end premium because it's a point per reception after five catches. But if you've got a tight end that can routinely get five plus catches a game, that gives you an edge at that position. Kelsey is that guy. I, uh, it's Adams for sure too. Why? It's non PPR. Keep that in mind. Why is it Adams instead of acres and Robinson? I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just having the conversation. Yeah. I think like there's enough uncertainty with acres and Robinson that Adams is going to be a probably 1300 yard double digit touchdown guy. Okay, so guys, give me, little, give me three names. Let's go. I'm I, I I'm going to agree. I'm going to say that Adams goes with Kelsey, and I'll put Acres there too. I'll put I'll Acres unless until we know for sure what's going on in Jacksonville. Yeah, if you can decide after the draft, and Jacksonville doesn't draft a running back, then I'd go Robinson over Acres. But I agree. I might go Acres and Robinson over Adams if that happens. Okay, this is from Dylan in Chicago. I mean, because it sounds like you can keep those guys forever. Dylan in Chicago. Last year was the first time I got into fantasy. I played in a PPR league. I went to the championship. And also, I was given a dynasty standard scoring team from a friend that's been going on for a few years. So the last dynasty rookie draft, I unknowingly nailed it with Dobbins, Justin Jefferson, and A.J. Dillon. But I didn't understand dynasty and not thinking about how anything worked. I dropped Jefferson and A.J. Dillon. So I don't make that mistake again. Can you please help me decide who to drop from the team to prepare for the next rookie draft? Is there anyone who you would keep from this list that I am considering dropping? Kiki QT, Marquise Brown, Mike Davis, JD McKissick, Tim Patrick, Devontae Parker, Logan Thomas, and Russell Gage. Oh, man. I, I am the Jack Nicholson gif going, no, 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 with Marquise <laughs> Brown. Please hang on to Marquise Brown. Agreed. Um, I think you can make the case for dropping literally everybody else. I don't know if I'm going to be in such a huge hurry to drop Devontae Parker from a dynasty league. Um, maybe Logan Thomas, depending on what your tight end situation is, and JD McKissick, just in case he ends up being serviceable again. Well, but if you well, if you're tight on roster spots, drop the and, Pittsburgh DST. You don't need two DSTs. So keep correct. And that DST is headed in the wrong direction. Yeah. Keep Marquise Brown. Man, like it's so weird to drop Devontae Parker and Logan Thomas in a dynasty league, but that's probably drop Justin Tucker. I would drop your kicker, personally. But I'm mm-hmm. assuming know. you don't have to keep a legal roster during this period. True. All right. So if you're going to choose between one, Parker or Logan Thomas, who are you keeping? Parker. Parker. Last question. A very long show today. Uh, this is from. Anything to get out of working with your kids, right, Adam? Oh uh, no, I love miss my kids. No. Uh, except I'm going to have to listen to Weezer. Over and over and over again for the next hour. That's the song. My name is Jonas. <laughs> Just okay. Couldn't couldn't wait to hear it all day. Most parents of kids under the age of five are listening to far more irritating songs than that song. I 
I rem- uh, he uh, he doesn't listen to those songs. He listens to rock. Of songs. course he doesn't. He's your kid. And I remember last year I was trying to sing him like "Twinkle Twinkle Little Star" or something, and he interrupts me. He goes, "Want poker face?" And I had to sing him <laughs> "Poker Face." All right, dear. Bl- I don't know who this is from. So, dear Blade, Laser, Blazer, and Michelle. I'd say top ten sports movie for sure. Dodgeball. Mm-hmm. I finished third in my startup dynasty league last year. Do I trade one of my running backs? 10 team, half PPR. It's super flex. Um, I've got Miles Sanders, Dobbins, Jonathan Taylor, James Robinson, Kareem Hunt, Rashad wow. Penny, Naeem Hines, and AJ Dillon. Hey. Yeah. So yes, he could you can use trade one of them. Well, what about the rest of his team? Is he thin at any other position? I'm looking at yes. quarterback. Unless Taysom oh, Hill. He's got Patrick Mahomes at quarterback. It's hard He's to be thin at that flex, position. Super flex league. Okay. So he's got Still. Taysom Hill, Sam Darnold, and Gardner Minshew. So he may not have a starting quarterback at Superflex. But he's got a rookie draft coming up. He does. His receivers I, are Ridley, Galladay, and then crap. Oh, Pittman, Rager. Yeah. I would try to trade Hunt and A.J. Dillon for a quarterback and wide receiver. Or one good quarterback slash wide receiver and then use your rookie pick assuming you have one to fill the other position that you don't get in the trade he says he could trade miles sanders for keenan allen would you do that no i don't think i'm doing that okay all right thanks for the emails everybody thanks for hanging around can i get a pick with keenan allen can i get a first round pick with keenan allen for miles sanders i'm doing that if it's a second round pick if it's an early second round pick i might do that Thanks for hanging around for a long show. And uh, thanks to Dave and Heath and Jamie. Why not? For being here today. We will talk to you on Monday with another edition of Fantasy Football Today. Everybody enjoy your weekend. If you want to hear some running back scouting reports, that's on Fantasy Football Today in five. See ya. Want more of the Fantasy Football Today podcast and nonstop year-round fantasy advice? It's simple. Hit the subscribe button and hang with us all throughout the year.